Well, hello everyone. I'm Deb Goodkin, and I'm the executive director of the Free BSD Foundation. And it's nice to be with all of you here in Argentina. Okay, I'm not really here in Argentina. I'm here in Boulder, Colorado. Um, but I hope in the future that when we can do conferences in person again, that I can come down and give a talk in person. So welcome to my talk. I'm going to talk about FreeBSD. And um, I only have 25 minutes here. And so uh, what I'm going to do is just uh, tell you about FreeBSD. And I assume that we have uh, people who've never heard of FreeBSD to people who are part of the community who are also watching this. And so one thing that I do want to do is, um, is highlight some of the resources that are available so that you can find out more information on your own. So who am I? I joined the foundation uh, 15 years ago. And before that, I was doing uh, firmware engineering and uh, development work on disk drives in various areas. And so now, besides running the foundation, um, I'm always trying to learn, learn more about operating systems and FreeBSD and open source. And so I'm trying to, or hoping to share some of that knowledge with you today. I'll skip, well, the goal is really to uh, tell you about FreeBSD and we'll cover some of the history and how the project works. And hopefully at the end, I'll convince you to at least at a minimum try FreeBSD. So what is FreeBSD? Yes, I have to show this because when you see things like this, um, I mean, there's still this perception out there at that FreeBSD is a Linux distribution. And it's not, it's its own operating system. Um, FreeBSD is, I, I view it as um, this, this world uh, comprised of three different components. And uh, so first you have the, what's the operating system? That's what you're actually work, or running on your computer. And then second, you have the project. And the project is the community that uh, creates and supports the operating system. And then finally, uh, we have the FreeBSD Foundation, which is a nonprofit based here in the United States. And um, our whole purpose is to support the FreeBSD project and community. So what is FreeBSD? It is a free and open source computer operating system. It's a complete operating system. So it's very, it's highly integrated. So you have a kernel, a user land, documentation and tools all integrated together um, by the same community. And it descended from the Berkeley Unix, which descended from the original Bell Labs Unix. And it is used by universities and corporations and individuals all over the world for over 27 years. So this is a really simplified abridged version of our history. And um, I have a little more expanded one here and it shows how uh, Unix started in 1969 out of Bell Labs and then in 1974 uh, Berkeley started working on it too doing research and um, adding improvements to it and then it was in 1992 that we had our first um, unencumbered uh, full-blown operating system that was available to the world and then in 1993, that's when both NetBSD and FreeBSD branched out on their own. So I like to include this chart, even though it's really busy, just shows that Unix here on the top, I think you can see my cursor. And, um, and then just how it's on, on the right side, you have all these proprietary versions that were used by these large corporations like DAC and IBM and Sun. And then as you go to the left, you see the open source versions of it. And FreeBSD is here, and you could see how it did descend from the original Berkeley Unix, and which was a descendant of the original Unix. And then I show Linux um, starting here in 1992. So you can see how um, they started around the same time. So who uses FreeBSD? Here I have a list of some of the more recognizable or marquee companies that use uh, FreeBSD, either in their products or in their infrastructure or in research. And you probably use FreeBSD. So FreeBSD is um, the foundation of Mac OS, Mac OS and iOS. Uh, if you're streaming movies, 
Uh, those are all being streamed on uh, Netflix devices. And if you're playing uh, with the PlayStation 4, then that's all running FreeBSD. So I use FreeBSD. I mean, the, the community is friendly and approachable. Uh, we're known to have excellent documentation, so it's easy to find out like how to do things or to learn more about what you want to want to know about. And uh, it's known for its uh, modern compilers and, and tooling. And we have a consistent development and release process, which um, we've built on over the years, especially coming out of Berkeley. We support a wide variety of architectures, uh, including ARM64 and, and RISC-V. And, um, and we're, you know, we're probably most known for the permissive BSD license. And finally, that we're secure, stable, and reliable. So I put this here just to show that the, the goal of the project and the people is really they want to create a product that will be used um, for many different purposes and without any strings attached. So how does the project work? It's independent of the FreeBSD Foundation. And I say that because uh, some people think that uh, the project is underneath the foundation that we're an umbrella organization and we're not, we're separate, even though the foundation's purpose is to, to support the project and the community. It's led by a nine person core team, which is elected. And we have a mentorship uh, process that we follow for uh, when you get your commitment. Uh, we are, the project is broken down into different functional teams to help support different you know, parts of the project and to help, help run it, whether it's development or you know, infrastructure. And it is a collaborative development environment. So to continue with the project model, it was uh, based on the original model that was developed from Berkeley. And then over the years, we followed that, but also improved it on it. There's over thousands of contributors. And so that includes uh, software developers and uh, technical writers, as well as people who advocate for the project. And then we have hundreds of committers who those are the people who can actually commit changes to the source tree. And like I said earlier, it's led by the nine member elected core team and then they lead and govern the project. And we do have a strong mentorship culture. And so when you become a committer, you have a mentor to help um, lead you and, and guide you along the way. And the last statement I have here, it's, you know, we don't have one person who oversees the whole project and makes the final decisions. It's really a democratic process. So this is a org chart. It's not really official. Um, when you, this is a list of all the uh, functional teams and um, in, sort of in the structure. So you see on the top that you have the foundation, you have the project and yeah, and they're not, the foundation is side by side with the project. And you have the core team who's that, it's sort of like governing body. And then you have these functional teams underneath. And um, the other teams I listed, list here at the bottom, um, they're not any less important. I just couldn't put that many red boxes on here. It would be so cluttered. And so I was just trying to highlight how we have all these different functional teams. And the nice thing about that is that now you have a group of people who uh, they might be more experienced that they could contribute in that area that they're, um, you know, experts or have that expertise or um, experience in, as well as uh, for people who uh, want to gain experience. Maybe they want to learn more about security and so they might be able to join that team and, and learn and, and work their way up. And down here, um, I, I put this to remind myself just to say that we do need people to join these different functional teams to help uh, the sustainability of the project. So if you're already involved with the project, uh, consider joining one of these teams. And here, the, the core team, this is the leadership body, and they have different responsibilities. Uh, part of it is uh, creating the or updating the charter of each functional team. Uh, they do, uh, you know, enforce the rules and help step in if there's any type of conflicts uh, within the project. 
and also just the um, administrative type of work that, that someone has to take on. And so we have over 400 committers right now. Uh, I don't remember what the exact number is. Um, we really need to update this, this data from last year, but it's showing the distribution um, of the different ages. And, and the reason why I want to update it is because we have a lot of young folks right now who are uh, contributing to the project. And I know because we have five interns on our team right now, but it shows that we do, we're constantly getting new people, young people. And, um, and then when you look at the right side, um, you, it, what it shows, and well, it's not really obvious, but a lot, a few of the people who are either the founders of FreeBSD or who are part of the Berkeley team of research, researchers and developers, that they're still part of the FreeBSD project, which is really cool, I think. And then the releases, I know this is sort of a messy slide here, but uh, basically we have this principle of least astonishment. So, you know, don't make change just to make a change and, um, and don't break things at work. So, um, so it's a very, you know, more thoughtful uh, process of making changes. And so because of that, when we do come out with a release, you know it's going to be reliable and um, you know, you're not going to have to back out all these changes if, if there's a problem. Um, and then we have two different releases. One is a major release and then we have our point release. Uh, we're coming up on doing a point release now, the 12.2, which would be soon. And that has more of the like the security uh, changes in there. And then a major release, our next one will be 13.0 and that's around April next year and that will have more like newer features and functionality will be incorporated into that. And then we have two main branches, uh, the current and the stable. And current is where all the changes go in um, and stable is once uh, things are, are uh, tested, then they could go into the stable branch. So how to contribute to the project. Uh, there's so many different ways. I mean, you always think of doing software development, but uh, writing documentation, and we really need uh, more reports maintainers. And so doing that, and advocacy, even what I'm doing right now would be considered being a contributor to the project. And it is easy to get started. And I have this graphic over here on the right, that if you go to the website, freebsd.org, uh, you'll see this over, I think it's like on the top right, and you click on it, and then it leads you to um, a lot of information on how you can get started with FreeBSD. So just to make some suggest suggestions now, I mean, you could translate or improve our documentation. Uh, like I said, we really need ports maintainers so to, to add one and to maintain that. And, um, or just go through our problem report list and, uh, and fix some bugs for us. We would love that. So exciting things that are happening right now in the project. Um, I mean, there's a lot of things, but just to highlight a few, uh, we are transitioning to Git. I know that finally. And so we'll have that, um, I, be I believe by the end of November, that's what they're shooting for. Um, open CFS, we've been involved with CFS for a really long time, but now there's, um, you know, separate uh, rep repository and project. And so we're part of that and we're using that code. So that means any of the features that are added to that, then those will also be available to FreeBSD. And uh, here's an example of where I put a URL to get more information on, um, actually I put the wrong URL here. So I'll update the slide when I upload them. It will be the right one. This is for a different, um, blog post we had, uh, Cherry and Cherry BSD, which I'll cover shortly, but that's a project at a University of Cambridge and uh, improving the desktop experience so people can run FreeBSD on their newer laptops and desktop systems. And last thing is just, um, you know, making sure that we're GPL free in our, our tools and helping to uh, modernize the tools and um, and so that, so this was actually the URL I wanted to put it down here. So if you remember that, then it has more information about why we did that. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about Cherry. Uh, we actually just had a talk um, by one of the leaders on that this morning and that's recorded and it'll be on our website. 
uh, but Cherry is capability hardware enhanced risk instructions. And the whole intention really is to help um, make the CPU more secure. And you can read a more detailed description here. Um, so what's exciting about what's going on at Cambridge is that they're collaborating with ARM and, um, and ARM's creating a CPO, CPU, which is going to incorporate Cherry and it's going to be a Cherry extended multi-core. And this ARM V8A is a processor that's used on almost all mobile devices in the world. So it will help make those secured and, uh, or more secure. And it's gonna run a uh, Cherry BSD. And the pro that program is called the Morella program. And, um, and really what ARM says is it's just gonna change the way that um, they design and, and program their processors in the future to enable better built-in security. So getting back to Cherry BSD, um, this is where FreeBSD gets involved. And Cher Cherry BSD is based on FreeBSD. And, um, and they've been doing research and work on this for so many years that uh, companies who are ex in universities who are interested in exploring this are going to want to use the Cherry BSD because um, they're so ahead of any other operating system out there. And I have links here to find out more information. Here's a list of why companies use FreeBSD. Uh, some of these things I'm going to run through really quickly because of timing. Uh, but I wanted to give an example of a company that uses FreeBSD and how they use it. Uh, so this is an uh, example of how Netflix uses it. I, I assume most of you have heard of Netflix, it's how you watch movies and your TV shows, and how they get these incredibly high transfer rates. And so they do use FreeBSD. It's a lightly customized version, meaning that they've put a few changes in. Um, they also upstream a lot of their changes back to the project. But um, they have this um, open connect appliance that are basically these servers that are at ISPs around the world. And, um, and they're getting, they're delivering over a hundred terabits per second globally at peak. And then like on one server or OCA, uh, 90 gigabits per second. So it's incredible. And this is commodity parts with FreeBSD too. And um, we have a case study that we actually just published this week. We haven't even run, promoted it yet. And you can go there and we have this great um, study on what they've done and the benefits. Some of the other features in FreeBSD, I won't go into those now, uh, but these are things that you can all look up. And containerization is also another um, thing that comes up right now. And so these are different methods that you could, um, use containerization within FreeBSD. And uh, so I just listed them here so you see what's available. And some are packages, some are concepts, um, and some are actual methods. So I have this slide because a lot of times I give this talk at, or this type of talk at a Linux conference. And so I'm just trying to encourage people that, um, you know, it's, it, you know, we don't want to be siloed, um, that it's really important to work together to talk maybe not develop together because it's two totally different operating systems, but we can learn a lot from each other. And so, I mean, even if you've been working with say Linux for you know, 20 years or whatever, um, you know, learn a, about another operating system because it'll teach you. I mean, we learn from each other's successes and failures. We have different um, you know, methodologies and philosophies that we follow. And so why do we do that? And so to understand that you may want to incorporate something or validate the way that you're doing it. And so it's just a great way to learn and become better at what you're, what you're doing. And because FreeBSD is such a small code base, it's a great reference platform. So you don't have so much code that you have to look through to learn. And I have this quote at the bottom, just it was something I read that it, you know, that FreeBSD made this Linux um, person a better admin and systems engineer. So why should you contribute to FreeBSD? And this is where we want to you know, try to encourage you to, to get involved and learn about FreeBSD. But it's, um, you know, there's a lot of open source projects out there and I think it's a great uh, welcoming and inclusive community to be a part of. Uh, it is a great way to learn systems programming and studying 
operating systems. And like I said, since the, the code base is small, like for example, the FreeBSD kernel is about five and a half million lines of code. And right now, when I look this morning, Linux is at, I think it's 27 million lines of code. This is just the kernel. And so, I mean, if you wanna look at source code to, you know, it's, there's so much less. And so it's just easier to, you know, there's less to look at, but you're still learning the same, you know, about operating systems and the concepts. Um, also, because our project is small in general, that there's less people, uh, it's easier to make a more notable notable contribution and impact to the project. And, um, and when I was showing the age uh, graph earlier in showing that, you know, there's still people who were involved with, you know, the Berkeley Annex and starting FreeBSD, and they're still involved with the project, that they're approachable. And they love talking to, especially like new people and, um, and telling them, you know, whether it's how something works or the history. And, um, and so, and that's really helpful and also makes you feel more, you know, welcome too. And it's democratically run. Um, you know, talking about how it's welcoming, I included this example of uh, this uh, Twitter handle and how this person uh, steps in to help people. And, and I, I really appreciated how they said, there's no such thing as a stupid question. And, and then they stepped in to try to help this person. So uh, why use FreeBSD on your desktop? Uh, one, the community documentation. I mean, if you need help with anything, you could just Google it or look at the FreeBSD handbook and find out how to do something uh, that it's stable, reliable, secure. Uh, ZFS, how that's big right now, and a lot of people want to use that. And there's over 33,000 software packages that are easy to install and available. And then that, um, that Pola philosophy that I talked about earlier. And so a great way to get started with FreeBSD is to try one of these distributions out that is based on FreeBSD. So if I've um, sparked your interest in learning more about FreeBSD, there's some different ways you can do this. Um, there is gonna be a workshop here at the conference and I have the time in the, well, the time in the day. And, um, and so this is a great way to uh, start using FreeBSD and I believe they'll be doing it on VirtualBox. And so you'll just install the image. And, um, but I would check the schedule too to make sure this is still the right time. It'll also be streamed and recorded. So you'll be able to access it after. Um, also, most of the major cloud providers uh, support FreeBSD. So there's all these here that um, yeah, you could try out and, um, or just install VirtualBox on your own and download the FreeBSD image and, um, and get started. And we do have how-to guides on our website. And uh, let's see here. Um, actually, I'll get to that shortly. Um, this was, I included this here just because uh, Linux Professional Institute does have a certification program. And the thing that I really like about this is if you're just trying to learn about FreeBSD, their objectives is a great checklist for just following to learn like, oh, so I should learn package install, package delete. And so it just gives you a way to, something to follow to learn about FreeBSD. And so here's my list of resources. And, um, and so this will help you if, you know, depending on what you wanna do, if you wanna learn about the history or if you wanna access the handbook. And here is our how-to guides, which you'll find here. And, um, and then also we have a magazine called the, Jour the FreeBSD Journal. Um, there are a couple of books too. Actually, I have a couple of them here that I would highly recommend. I don't know if I can get this. Yeah, maybe I can. <clears throat> and I, it looks like I lost my slide too. But um, I would recommend getting this book, The Absolute FreeBSD, if you're really interested in learning more about the internals of the design and implementation of the operating system. Let's see if we can see this. This is an excellent book. And uh, so I, I would highly recommend uh, getting one or the other or both. And, um, but the big thing is, uh, you know, just depending on what you wanna do, I would go to that um, freebsd.org and uh, click on the new to FreeBSD and that's where it's gonna have tons of information to help you get started. 
And, um, and that's all I have. And now I'd be happy to take questions. So thank you so much for sitting here and listening. And I hope that you are encouraged to get started with FreeBSD. Thank you. Eh, ahí me dice el bot que ya la tenemos a nuestra próxima speaker, así que voy a cambiar al inglés si me disculpan. Eh, Deb, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hello, how are you? And welcome to Nerdiarla. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. No problem. I hope you're doing safe over there. And time is really tight here, and we have a lot of questions about your talk, so let's dive into it right now, okay? Okay, sounds good. Good. So, first question is, can FreeBSD be used as a day-to-day -day SO for standard users? Uh, yes, it can. Easy and fast. Uh, we have, <laughs> so to continue. <laughs> so, um, so FreeBSD supports over uh, 33,000 software packages that you can install, and it's really easy to install using PAC, uh, PKG. Um, and um, so, for example, if you want to use it as your general desktop and you want to um, connect to the internet, then you would install some type of, um, you know, internet browser and you can get your mail and there's, and these are all open source um, software packages, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So, um, so you, if you want to use something like Office, there's an open source equivalent. And so, so, I mean, there's thousands of packages that are available for you to do your daily, um, you know, work <laughs> on a computer. Awesome. Uh, okay, next question. Uh, is it possible to run software packages intended for other operating systems such as Linux or Windows in FreeBSD? So right now, so we have a um, we have software that um, is, well, it's called the it's a feature called the Linux Elator, and so it will allow you to uh, run many of the Linux uh, packages. Awesome, yeah. So it's compatible. Uh, okay, next question from Christian. I'm intrigued about the difference on the Linux and BSD kernel. Is there any comparative or maybe uh, an introduction about the BSD kernel structure? There is, um, well, that's a really good question, actually. Um, <laughs> You're here, kidding. Let me look for my You're book. kidding. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> this, is, this is a nice thing about not being in the conference because then I can access, <laughs> so actually, so I'll show you here, I know there's a glare. Um, this is an excellent, uh, basically, textbook on understanding the internals. I'll keep holding it up. The internals of the FreeBSD operating system. There isn't, um, I mean, as far as I know, like a comparison. Um, I, I, I'm not aware of anything that's written up, but it never hurts to search, you know, Google um, for the differences. Um, but you'd want to make sure that you were, you know, you specified the kernel design so that it went into more details about what the differences are. Awesome. Uh, good. Next, next question from Facundo. Uh, given Sony's, Sony's uh, usage of FreeBSD in Orbis OS, uh, have they made uh, notable contributions to FreeBSD? Um, they, I believe... Um, that they make their changes and they keep them, that they, they do not upstream that many changes. Okay, good. Uh, next one from Facundo as well. Um, uh, what do you think that nowadays, even if, BSD ha even if B FreeBSD has a longer history from a, from a certain POV than Linux, it seems Linux is ubiquitous in server software when FreeBSD isn't? I don't understand what the question is, though. Uh, I, I guess he's referring on since, you know, Linux, uh, FreeBSD has been longer, uh, you know, around more or less the same time than Linux. Why is it not as popular as Linux for servers? Oh, yeah, that's, and that is a good question. Um, so the popularity of Linux really happened um, in the early 90s when both Linux and FreeBSD were out. and a FreeBSD had been hit with a lawsuit, and so it held back, um, you know, the support and promotion. 
of an acceptance of it because most of, you know, a lot of the developers were tied up in the lawsuit and mm -hmm. in the lawsuit was because of you know previously came from Berkeley Unix which came from um, AT&T Bell Labs and um, and so the lawsuit was really more from the whole BSD side of it but um, so at that time uh, the companies that were interested in that like open source type of operating system, put their funding into Linux at the time. And so it, it got a lot of use and promotion and uh, marketing at that time. Um, you know, one thing with FreeBSD is that um, there's a lot of companies that use it and because of the BSD license, um, they don't have to, you know, they don't have to give back, which is totally fine. Um, and, and you don't know that they're using uh, FreeBSD because that's not the product that they're trying to sell. They're trying to, um, or create, they're creating something like the PS4 that is built on top of FreeBSD and it's that product that they're trying to sell. Okay, uh, good. Uh, next question uh, from Gabriel. Uh, what would you say gives uh, FreeBSD that edge on performance over a Linux distribution? Well, you can go in and um, make changes within the kernel. And, um, and so meaning that you can put your changes in, it's easier to get your changes accepted. And also because of the BSD license, um, if you're putting your IP into the kernel, this is what Netflix does, you don't have to give it back. And so you can make these tweaks to increase your performance, and um, and um, and you don't have to. Um, I mean, you just have more of the ability to go in and, and make changes within the kernel. Right, you can t fine tune it to your own needs. Exactly. Yes. Uh, Okay, Jesus, uh, does FreeBSD run on all hardware? Of course it does, but I, I suppose that let's define all, right? It is, right. <laughs> it is 2020. Uh, okay, uh, let's go to the next one. It is, it is in Spanish, so I will try to translate it. Uh, it's from Pablo. He says, I am, a Sol I am an architect, I am a Solaris architect, and I had to change to DevOps engineer. How can I maintain my professional profile, my Unix based professional pro profile, using FreeBSD? I think this is more like a career question, right? Well, yeah, it sounds like it. Um, well, I mean, what we're trying to do is get more people to contribute to FreeBSD. So mm -hmm. um, by contributing, you all your work is public. And, and so if you're a developer, then you're, um, you know, you're, uh, how you implement things, how you uh, go about uh, designing things, I, I mean, that's maybe not as obvious, but actually when you document your, what you develop, I mean, that's public knowledge. And so, um, so anyway, so all of your work is available like a res, you know, like a resume. And so you can gain more experience, you uh, can get more skills that make you more marketable. Um, I'm not sure if that's what the person is asking. But, but it's really being able to get experience in different areas uh, that you're interested in and, um, and that work, those contributions be made uh, public. So companies that you're applying to um, can get access to that, whether it's you know, writing code, uh, document, you know, if you're uh, interested in being a technical writer, uh, your writing would be available. Also, sure. as well as your, your communication skills so people can see you know, depending on what kind of job you're looking for, uh, they could see if you're giving uh, presentations. And you know, a lot of people will do presentations on FreeBSD as well as uh, uh, people will do like videos and uh, how to's and things like that. Yeah, uh, and that's the spirit we are trying to, you know, um, spread here about the community contributing and being part of a of a technical community as well. So, so yeah. So I have a couple more questions, but these are more, more from other staff that came in outside of the chat. So we are trying to know how this pandemic is affecting everybody these days. I know that, I know that uh, we're all aware of the fire, uh, the fires going on on, on Colorado, so I hope you're safe, mm. but let's try to leave that out for a second. How is 
the pandemic treating you so far and how it is affecting uh, your work? So, um, I mean, there's, it affects it in, in many different ways. So first, um, how it affects the foundation. Yes, exactly. Uh, previously foundation, yes. yeah. So we do have employees all over the world. So most of them have already been working at home, but we did have half of our staff working in an office in Canada. And so we, um, and those were mostly interns. And so we actually had to go through how to help them uh, get set up uh, to work from home because they weren't used to doing that. And, uh, and so uh, now that we're, you know, what, 10 months into the pandemic or something? <laughs> Yeah, I think. Um, that, yeah, eight. so everyone's pretty used to it. We're, we're set up and um, we're, we're set up to handle that. The other area where it really affected us, well, there's a few more. Um, one is we would typically travel all around the world. So for example, I would have submitted this talk to give at the conference and I would have been there uh, right now in Argentina, which oh, would yeah. be cool. And so none of us are traveling. Right. <laughs> so we have a, a basically a travel ban um, on staff and uh, you know, people within the foundation. Um, and then also it has affected us financially because um, you know, everyone's struggling and we do uh, depend 100% on uh, donations from individuals and corporations and um, you know we're not quite getting what we have been in the past and so uh, mm -hmm. this time of year that's I'm um, working on that and um, and then as far as the project goes uh, we typically have at least three face-to-face -face conferences throughout the year around the world and um, and those have all been canceled one went virtual which was great and the and we are actually putting on a virtual uh, vendor developer summit uh, next month. And so that will actually be uh, one of the first times that we're all interacting again. And, um, and it's really important because it really helps people to, I mean, everyone communicates on IRC and through forums and stuff. But really, when you have a chance to be face to face with someone, you, you get a lot more done. I mean, you. Um, you can understand people better. Uh, there is a, you know, you're actually hearing what people are saying and you get people who are just sitting side by side and working together and they come up with new ideas or they might get excited about contributing to a project that someone else is working on. And so, uh, yeah, so we're losing that, that face-to-face -face opportunities right now. Right. So. Uh I guess you'll stick around through uh, on the Slack channel if anyone wants to ask you any questions where you'll be able to connect with people. Um, so I, yeah, I would be happy to do that. What and what channel is that? That would be the charlas in English, in oh, Spanish. Okay. Yes. So that's the channel we're connecting in. And okay. if anyone wants to know how to contribute more actively, how to be part of their interest in, BS, in free BSD, uh, they can contact you, right? Yes. Yeah, I would love that. Awesome. Good. And make sure and make sure you attend Roller's uh, <laughs> workshop tomorrow. Yeah, and, and that, that's what I wanna wanted to ask you. Any specific places uh, for people to go and donate, contribute on FreeBSD? Any specific uh, projects right now? Well, um, I, I posted a link just to the how to contribute in uh -huh. the little chat box, um, and I can put that also in the Slack channel. Uh, so I would definitely go to the how to contribute page on the freebsd.org uh -huh. website. Um, the FreeBSD Foundation, we also have a resource page that helps you um, just, we have how-to guides to help you get started, like mm -hmm. a virtual box. Um, we have videos of introductory uh, talks on different areas of FreeBSD. Mm -hmm. So we awesome. call that FreeBSD Fridays. So I would highly recommend people watching those videos. I too. hope we can get more contributors from Argentina in the future. So go there. We would love that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Deb, thank you so much for joining us in this very complicated time. So I really appreciate your time and just wave to the camera and say bye to our <laughs> Q&A audience. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much for attending and bye. I'll see you in person next year, maybe. Uh, oh, yeah. Bien. Uh, se fue el Q&A. Se terminó la el Q&A de la charla de Deb Goodking. Eh, ella es parte del equipo de la FreeBSA Foundation. Su charla... FreeBSD.
Code Community and Collaboration. Así que se nos estuvo uniendo desde Boulder, Colorado, donde está todo prendido a fuego. Así que más gracias todavía a Deb por subirse a, a, a nerdearla.